Welcome to the avenue. It's great to see you. Um, I'm not one of your pastors. You probably noticed that. Uh, I'm a friend from down the road a little bit. My name is Austin Fisher. I'm the lead pastor at Vista Community Church down in Temple, Texas. Uh, I'm a friend of David's. I've known David for a few years, mainly through his son Chase. He was a good friend of mine in college. Don't, don't hold it against me. Um, and then also your missions pastor, Mark Miller, is a really good buddy of mine. Mark's a fantastic guy. I've known Mark for a really long time. One of the perks of knowing someone for a really long time is you have all sorts of super embarrassing photos of them, kind of like this one. A lot of y'all didn't know that Mark had that underneath the hood, so next time you have to ask him, right? So uh, at my church, we're, we're doing this summer series where we're walking through these seven letters written to these seven different churches in ancient Asia Minor. It's an area that we now know today as Turkey. Now, these letters were written from an island called Patmos by a man named John, who tradition says was John the Apostle, one of Jesus' original 12 disciples. And so here's the scene. Uh, John is on this barren rock of an island called Patmos, and he's doing hard time, okay? He's not on some island resort, all-inclusive, you know, fit kicked up, uh, sipping on a pina colada, writing a soon-to-be inspirational bestseller about the end times, the original left behind But No, John is an old man working himself to death in a rock quarry as a prisoner. In fact, legend has it that he was only transported to this island prison after he was first boiled alive in oil and somehow survived. So next time you're feeling persecuted because you had to wait in line for 10 minutes at Starbucks to get your mocha frappuccino, try to keep it all in perspective. And so that's the scene. That's John's situation. And then one day he's in the spirit, okay, this vague phrase used in Revelation 1.10, when all of a sudden he hears this noise that's as loud as a trumpet, is what he says. And he turns to see what the commotion is, and he has this vision, this vision that starts with the resurrected Christ giving him these messages he once sent to these seven different churches. And so we're going to read this message that Jesus wanted sent to this church called Smyrna. It's in Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. We'll have it on the screen for you. It's pretty brief, though. All right, Revelation 2, 8 through 11. Jesus talking, he says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, I want you to write this. The first and the last who was dead and has now come to life says this. I know your tribulation and I know your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are really a synagogue of Satan. Now do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. Now, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be heard by the second death. Uh, Revelation 2, 8 through 11. So here's what we know about this ancient city called Smyrna. Uh, it was a very large and important city. It was home to one of the greatest seaports in the Mediterranean world, which means it was a center for commerce, a center for culture. Uh, we also know that it had a temple in it that was dedicated to Caesar. Caesar was, of course, the leader, the emperor of the Roman Empire. Now, why would you have a temple dedicated to a man, right? Well, there was a temple dedicated to Caesar because Caesar was not just considered a great man and a great ruler. Caesar was also considered, in some sense, divine. He was considered a god or the son of a god. So Caesar was worshipped, and worshipping Caesar was considered patriotic because Caesar was the leader of the Roman Empire. Makes sense? So if you didn't worship Caesar, then that meant that you didn't pledge your allegiance to the empire, and that meant you would be singled out for persecution because you were an unpatriotic troublemaker. If you've ever wondered why all the earliest Christians were persecuted, this is why. Not because they worship Jesus as God. No, no, no. There were thousands of gods in the ancient world. If the Christians wanted to worship another one and call him Jesus, the Romans could care less about that. The earliest Christians were persecuted because they refused to worship Caesar and be good patriots of the empire, right? So on the one hand, the church at Smyrna is experiencing persecution because they won't be good patriots. On the other hand, they're experiencing persecution from this group of people who, according to verse 9, Nine, say they are Jews, but are actually a synagogue of Satan, which if you didn't pick up on, it's not a compliment, all right? So who are these people, this synagogue of Satan? Well, let's put on our historical thinking caps for just a second to understand something that's a little bit complicated, not very, but it's very, very important to understand if you want to understand your New Testament, okay? So you and I, we tend to think of Judaism and Christianity as two very different religions, right? Right? But that was not yet the case in the first century world. Right? The lines between Christianity and Judaism had not yet become that clear. Because think about it. Jesus was a Jew. 
All of Jesus' first disciples were Jews. Jesus came claiming to be the fulfillment of the Jewish story. And so what we see happening in the first century is that there are these Jews who accept Jesus as the Messiah. We'll come to call them Christians. That would be us. And then there are these Jews who reject Jesus as the Messiah. And so this rivalry gets set in motion between the two groups regarding which one is truly the continuation of God's covenant with Israel. I hope that makes some sense to you. We see it spilling over at numerous places in the New Testament, especially in the writings of Paul, and we see it here again in Revelation 2. Now, reading between the lines a little bit, it would appear as though this church at Smyrna is experiencing persecution from both the Roman civic authorities, because they won't be good patriots, and then also for their Jewish cousins. Okay, this church at Smyrna is small, it's poor, it's powerless, and it's persecuted by both the Roman and the Jewish religious establishment. Which, when you think about it, means the church at Smyrna could not be more not like us, right? The church at Smyrna, they're small, they're poor, they're powerless, they're persecuted, which means it could not be more not like my church, the Vista, and my church is a lot like your church, so it means it could not be more not like this church, the Avenue. I mean, y'all, you're not a small church. You're a big church, right? The average church in America is 75 people. Do you know that? Y'all have 75 two-year-olds in a classroom right now holding their teacher hostage, right? And you're not a poor church. You're a rich church. Look at your building. You know, you got this nice budget and nice place and nice location, and you're not a powerless church. No, you're an incredibly powerful church. Countless leaders in your community attend here, and you're respected. You're admired. It's good for your social status that you go to the avenue, and you're not a persecuted church. Come on now. You're a comfortable church. You're an incredibly comfortable church. In fact, we're all so incredibly not persecuted that the closest most of us will ever get to being persecuted is having to endure some sort of rude or condescending comment from Bill Maher. You know, the apostle John was persecuted by being boiled alive in oil. We are persecuted by no longer having mandatory Christian prayer in public schools. You know, we could not be more not like this church at Smyrna. So what could we possibly learn from this church that was nothing like us? So show of hands. You've got to limber up a little bit. Show of hands. How many of you think that the world is becoming a more dangerous place? Show of hands. How many of you think that the world is becoming a more dangerous place? Okay. Yeah, it looks about right. Now, recent studies have shown that uh, well over half of Americans think that the world is becoming a more and more dangerous place. In fact, every year for the last 25 years, over 60% of Americans have said that America is becoming a more and more dangerous place. Uh, in his remarks at the Southern Baptist Convention a couple of weeks ago, Vice President Pence concluded by saying this, With your support and your prayers and God's help, we will make America safe again. Now, all this would explain why we parents tend to be much more protective of our children than our parents were with us, right? Now, I don't know about you, but my parents were way more laissez-faire about my safety than I tend to be about my little kid's safety. Now, I don't mean to imply my parents were negligent. They're not here to defend themselves. No. Uh, What I mean was, you know, it was completely normal for my parents to do stuff like let me play unsupervised outside in the neighborhood from sun up to sundown. I see a lot of heads nodding. It's nostalgia. Yeah, I'll, on a typical summer Sunday when I was growing up, man, I would grab a Pop-Tart or whatever. I'd be outside playing basketball, football, bike, cops and robbers, you name it, from sun up to sundown. My parents would finally find me at like 8.30, dream me home. Uh, you know, most of us, we would put out an amber alert if our kids were gone more than about five seconds, wouldn't you? 911, what's your emergency? My kid's been gone. How long? Five seconds. I need the National Guard, the Coast Guard, maybe even a SWAT team shut down the neighborhood, right? <laughs> Now, study after study has shown that we're getting more and more protective of our children. Specifically, that we're far less likely to let them walk to school by themselves, explore the neighborhood unsupervised, or even play by themselves. And maybe that's unfortunate, but again, we, we have to, you know, because the world's becoming a more and more dangerous place. But is it? Is it? Is the world actually becoming a more and more dangerous place. I mean, we've established that that we think it is, but is the world actually becoming more dangerous? Now, typically, it's, it's almost impossible to answer enormous questions like that. But in this case, it's actually quite simple. Countless studies have been done, and the results are in, and the answer is no. No, the world is absolutely, positively, demonstrably not 
becoming more and more dangerous. In fact, the exact opposite is true. The world is absolutely, positively, demonstrably becoming safer and safer and safer. Now, I can tell some of you are skeptical. You got crossed arms, so I got a few stats for you. So, to be specific, the rate of violent crimes like murder, assault, and rape have been dropping for decades, and they're actually at near all-time lows right now. All right, for example, here's a graph of the homicide rate in Europe stretching all the way back to the 1300s, right? So 700-plus years of data. And you do not need a Ph.D. in how to read a graph to know that all those lines going down to the right mean there are less people getting killed in England, right? Now, the same actually holds true in America as well, where the violent crime rate has fallen between 50 and 75% over the last 25 years. So to put that together with another number, over the last 25 years, the overwhelming majority of Americans have said America is getting more and more and more dangerous, when in reality, every year for the last 25 years, America is getting safer and safer and safer and safer. This is a graph of actually the people killed in war over the last 70 years. Right? So after the obvious spike during World War II, there have also been fewer and fewer and fewer people killed in war. And I could literally cite statistics all day long, but that would only be fun for me. Uh, and so you probably get the point at this point. Uh, Stephen Pinker wrote a really interesting book about all this called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And here's how he summarizes his findings on violence in the modern world. It's a great quote. Violence has been in decline for thousands of years. And today we may be living in the most peaceable era in the existence of our species. Or as I like to say it, we, and especially we here in suburban Texas, y'all, we, we are the safest people in the history of the world. You know that, right? I don't mean metaphorically. I mean literally, we are the safest people in the history of the world. Which brings us to this really interesting question, right? Why do we think that the world is getting more and more dangerous when the world is actually becoming safer and safer and safer? I can think of at least three answers to that question. They, they all relate to each other. And first off, first answer would be biology. Biology. You science people, you never get anything in sermons. So this is for you, and this is what I mean here. So there's this great psychological term that's called trait negativity bias. Trait negativity bias. And here's what it means. We pay more attention to and we place more value on negative information than we do positive information. All right, we pay more attention to, we place more value on negative information than positive information. Negative information literally weighs heavier on our brains than positive information does. So, for example, all these experiments have been done and they've proven that we are more unhappy about losing $50 than we are happy about finding $50. Okay? Or more to the point for our purposes this morning, uh, when I'm preaching a sermon to you like I am this morning, right, you are biologically hardwired to be more affected by something I say that you really don't like than you are to be affected by something I say that you really do like, right? That thing I say that you really hate that gets underneath your skin is biologically wired to stick with you. You will never, ever forget that I said it, whereas that thing I said that you loved, that you thought was the greatest thing ever, is biologically wired to pass right through you. And that's why David and I never take it personal when you're negative about our sermons. We know that you literally cannot help yourselves. It's down in your DNA. Right? Now, trait negativity bias, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it from an evolutionary perspective because simply put, you know, uh, fear is a really good survival tactic. Right? Think about this. Conditioned through millions of years of living in a fallen world, we have learned that our fear helps us survive because there's no need to pay much attention to the birds and the butterflies, right? They're not a threat to your survival. Ain't nobody ever been mauled by a butterfly, but you had better pay attention to the lion in the bushes or the rattlesnake underneath the rock. Right? In summary, we're literally biologically biased. It's literally down in our reflexes. We're biologically biased toward fear because fear helps us survive. Or as our grandparents told our parents and as our parents told us and as we are going to tell our children, better safe than sorry. Ah, you see how it works. Which brings us to the second reason that we think the world is becoming more dangerous even though it's not. And that second reason is technology. Technology. Now, what do we mean here? Well, Back in the, uh, would have been the late 90s, uh, this professor named George Gerbner coined this really great phrase called mean world syndrome. Isn't that a good phrase? Mean world syndrome. And his theory in a nutshell was this. The more mass media we consume, 
the more we're conditioned to think that the world is a mean, nasty place because mass media is biased toward the negative. Right? The more mass media we consume, the more we're conditioned to think the world is this terrible, nasty place because mass media is biased toward the negative. And I really don't think there's any disputing that mass media is biased toward the negative. Right? I mean, just watch the local news tonight. And which story are you more likely to hear? You know, uh, today a little boy hung out with his family dog. He petted the dog and gave him a slice of turkey, and the dog repaid his kindness with a sloppy lick on the face. Back to you at the studio. Have you ever heard that story? Have you ever heard, today somebody was nice to somebody, a special report coming next week? No, you never hear that story. What will you hear? Dog, moth, child, you know, video coming next week. Are there more dogs, special report coming? Those are the sort of stories you hear on the news. No need to belabor the point here. You get it. We're consuming more mass media than ever before. Mass media is heavily biased toward the negative because we're heavily biased toward the negative, so they're just giving us what we want, all of which has the cumulative effect of making us think the world is becoming more dangerous, even though it's not, which brings us to the third reason that we think the world's more dangerous, even though it's not, and also brings us back to our original question, what can we learn from this church that was nothing like us? And the third reason we think the world's becoming more dangerous, even though it's not, is due to a spiritual phenomenon that I have given the very technical name, spiritual wimpiness. Okay, and it's very difficult to explain, so I'm going to do my best. Okay, Spiritual wimpiness means that spiritually speaking, we have become very wimpy. Not following? Okay, I'll try harder. I mean, just think about this. Uh, you all know Matthew 16, 24. You might not know you know it, but you know it, right? Jesus, he turns to his disciples and he says, hey, if you want to be my disciple, you want to follow me, then you got to pick up your cross and follow me, okay? You know that verse. When Jesus says that, you got to pick up your cross if you want to follow me. It's not, you know, just like a metaphor. It's not a metaphor. Jesus literally meant that if you follow me, it will greatly increase your chances of an early death, Jesus literally meant, if you follow me, then your life is going to become more dangerous, not less dangerous. And just in case we have forgotten, here's what happened to the 12 people who said yes to following Jesus, okay? Judas hung himself. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. James, the son of Zebedee, was executed by Herod. The other James was stoned, then clubbed to death. Andrew was crucified in Greece. Thomas was speared to death by soldiers. Philip was murdered by Roman authorities. Matthew was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was martyred. Simon was martyred. Matthias was burned alive, which leaves our friend John, the writer of Revelation, as the only disciple who died of natural causes after he was burned alive in oil and then sentenced to life in prison on a rock quarry. Now, y'all, I am not an expert in statistical analysis, but I feel like there is some kind of trend here. <laughs> Somebody smarter than me will have to figure it out. Right? And moving past the age of the apostles to the life of the early church, when someone became a Christian in the first century, it was with the obvious expectation that their allegiance to Jesus would not be a source of earthly safety, but earthly danger. Right? When you signed up to get baptized in the first century, you were signing yourself and probably your whole family up for persecution and maybe even martyrdom. Right? When you filled out the form, like, I want to be baptized, you click the box, like, I want to be baptized, yes, I know I'm probably going to die. <laughs> that was the second box you checked. And to state the obvious, my, how things have changed, yeah? And I really don't think it's any stretch to say that we tend to come to Jesus with the exact opposite set of expectations, we come to Jesus expecting safety. We come to Jesus expecting comfort. We come to Jesus expecting leisure. And as our world has become safer and safer, we've become more accustomed to safety. And as we've become more accustomed to safety, we have started to feel more entitled to safety. Or to come right out and say it, you know, we think Jesus is obligated to keep us safe. I know I do. Pick up your cross if you want to follow me. Has somehow become... Follow me if you want to make sure you never end up on a cross. And if you think I'm being too dramatic here, I understand. But what I would encourage you to do is pay attention to the prayers that you hear yourself and other people praying. And what I think you will discover is that the most, prayer, the most common prayer you hear prayed will be some variation of God, keep us safe. Yeah? I pray that prayer all the time. 
And I've gone looking for that prayer in the Bible. You know, you find it some in the Old Testament, you find it a lot in Psalms, but you really don't find that prayer very much in the New Testament. I mean, Jesus certainly never teaches us to pray and ask for safety, right? Our Father who art in heaven, you know it. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, so long as you keep me and my loved ones safe until we're 85 or 90. Thanks, amen. No, right? Jesus teaches us to pray and ask for the coming of God's kingdom regardless of the cost to us and our safety, right? Jesus Jesus doesn't ask us to stay as safe as we can and then see what kind of room that leaves for radical faithfulness. No, Jesus asks us to be radically faithful and then see what kind of room that leaves for safety. And while I still pray that God would keep my little boy safe, I got two little boys, a three-year-old named Wyatt, and a one-year-old named Davis. And I pray that God would keep him safe. I do. But I try to make sure that my primary prayer for my little boys is not that God would keep them safe. No, my primary prayer for my little boys is that God would keep them brave and courageous and faithful because there's something worse than being unsafe. And that's being a coward. That's being unfaithful. All right, which brings us back to Revelation 2, verse 10. We're going to read it again together. Jesus says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death, though, and I'll give you the crown of life. At the very end of this really short letter to this small, poor, powerless, persecuted church at Smyrna, Jesus says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Right, notice he doesn't say, do not fear, because I'd never let you suffer. No, no, no. He says, let's be clear. You're going to suffer, but do not be afraid. Now, due to biology and technology and spiritual wimpiness, we think the world's becoming more and more dangerous, even though the world is actually becoming safer and safer. And yet, with all that said, y'all, I have no desire to convince you that you shouldn't be afraid because the stats tell us that the world is just such a safe place. No, I want to convince you that you shouldn't be afraid because Jesus said that you shouldn't be afraid. And at the end of the day, our courage cannot be rooted in how safe our surroundings are. And our courage cannot be rooted in how comfortable we can make our environments. Our courage can only be rooted in Jesus' faithfulness to us because every other kind of courage is just fear and control masquerading as courage. The church at Smyrna wasn't safe. And Jesus made no promises about keeping them safe. And yet he still said to them, do not fear and not because I'll keep you safe. In fact, I won't keep you safe. In fact, many of you will die. In fact, technically speaking, all of you will die. And all of you will die too. Do not be afraid because I have overcome the grave. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So what can we learn from this church That was literally nothing like us. Well, maybe we can learn how to be brave again. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are a scared people, and and the world can be a really scary place. Terrible things happen, and our loved ones die, and, and we can't really do much about it, so it's hard to not seek safety at all cost. We are, by nature, scared people living in a scary world. And yet, while our fear has proven a very helpful survival tactic, it's not a very good discipleship tactic. So we gather this morning, and we hear Jesus say to us again, don't you be afraid. He asks us to live courageously in a scary world, but not because we've learned to control the world, and not because you've promised to keep us safe in the world. No, you ask us to live courageously because you have overcome the grave. So what do we have to fear? But that can be really hard to believe. So maybe today you could help us believe it a little more. You could help us act on it a little more. And maybe just, maybe we'll leave here people who are just a little bit braver for it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we want to give you a few moments to respond. And all that means is a few moments to slow down, right? Don't start thinking about what you're going to go get for lunch. Don't start thinking about Monday. Please don't think about Monday. Uh, No, slow down. Let the Holy Spirit get beneath the surface and do a deeper work that God probably wants to do today.
okay? You can respond by standing and singing, by sitting and praying, by coming forward to receive communion. Respond however you want, but never waste an opportunity to respond.